right outside the door by the bulletin. And then also, uh, we have the Acts and Facts from the Institute for Creation Research. This is the new quarterly magazine, and we encourage you to pick those up on your way out this morning. Now, we're over in the book of Exodus, and we're in Exodus chapter 15, a rather exciting passage. Yes, oh yes, and Keith has another announcement. Keith, would you like to stand up and give that? Okay, I uh, just wanted to remind you that the uh, next Friday fun night will be this Friday, 8.15. I'd like to have everyone there. And so you're invited to Friday fun night, and that's not just for little kids, that's for everybody, and you will have a great time. So please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we looked at just a moment ago in Exodus chapter 15, starting a new series here today, and I hope that it will be a very profitable series for you, because we'll be dealing with music in the Bible. Now, first, I want to review and give you a quick overview, because this is the background for the series that we're about to begin. What we've learned so far in the text, which is the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, where we saw 1,200 flat tires all at once, we learned some principles, five principles. Number one, obedience produces blessing and fulfillment of the promises of God. Number two, sometimes it takes a season for God to answer our requests, but his timing is best. The children of Israel cried out for a very long time before God finally decided now was the moment. Number three, when part of creation can fulfill the will of God, he uses it. The land was dry after being blown on for the duration of the night. It was dry, it was not mud or marsh, as the liberals would have you believe. Principle four, we're accountable to act when God commands us before we can receive his blessing. You must act when God gives you a command. You don't wait for him to do something. Moses had to act first. God waited for Moses to obey before sending the wind and parting the sea. Principle number five, verse 21, we saw in the previous chapter parallels what happened to creation. God is creating again here in chapter 14 where he is making a new nation, Israel. And today when a person trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, God creates a new creature. That's what Paul says. When you trusted Christ, God made you into a new creature. You went from death to life and from darkness to light. You were on, instead of the side where the Egyptians had darkness so, so dark they could feel it, over on the side where the Israelites had light all night long. Then we looked at the 12 different terms for wall in the New Testament because those waters stood on both sides of them and it was dry in the middle. We saw that the word used in Exodus was a protecting wall, a massive city wall. We saw many other places in the Old Testament where that word is used, always of a massive city wall like the walls of Jericho and the wall of Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah. It was not wet ground. It was not Pharaoh getting his chariot stuck in the mud. It was a wall on both sides of them. Pharaoh couldn't circumvent them and go around and head them off at the pass. It was a wall at least 600 feet tall because they crossed the Red Sea at a place which we discussed, which is about 600 feet deep. It was a clear miracle. Six million people were clearly not wading through mud in a swamp. We made several practical observations on the text. Number one, the reason for the strong east wind blowing all night off the very dry Saudi Arabian Peninsula was to evaporate and dry the seabed, not to hold up the walls of water. A wind that would be strong enough to hold up massive walls of water 600 feet deep would have blown the Israelites and the Egyptians all the way across Africa. The second practical observation, the reason that the Egyptians followed the Jews into the sea was the fear of Pharaoh was clearly greater than the fear of a miraculous phenomenon. I hope you picked that up in the song of the text today. That's a song, those first 21 verses in Exodus 15 are a song, and it explains this to us. The fear of Pharaoh was greater than the fear of the miraculous phenomenon. They had begged Pharaoh before, but they'd never rebelled during those 10 supernatural plagues against Egypt. And it's a possible, we don't know for sure, but a possible rationale was they thought, well, if the water falls, uh, it'll get the Jews as well as getting us. And they also believed that Pharaoh was God and thought he would take care of them. You know, it's stupid to trust the wrong God. It's really stupid to trust the wrong God. He cannot do anything for you. All the way through the Old Testament, Israel stupidly kept going after false gods because those gods were fun. Do you ever wonder why Israel followed after Baalim and the Ashtaroth, the Baals and the Ashtaroths? Why in the world did Israel do those stupid things? It's because they had fun. Remember the matter of Baal Peor? 
You remember Balaam, who could not curse Israel, finally told Balak, the king of Moab, well, listen, here's what you do. You take your pretty little girls and you send them down there to the camp of the Israelites and they'll seduce them and they'll start committing fornication and God will judge them. Then you won't have to worry about fighting them. And that's what happened. And Phineas, in a rage, took a javelin and he ran it through to a man and a woman who were fornicating. The woman who was of the Moabites and he killed them both. And God's hand of judgment was stayed. You understand why people today follow false gods, why there's a lot of false god worship? Through music, by the way, in so-called evangelical churches today, is because it's fun. It stimulates the flesh. <laughs> Be careful. We see that here in our text. Practical observation number three. The text clearly states, and we saw that in chapter 14, that the Egyptians knew the name of the true God. After all, they had personal experience of seeing and feeling the pain of the ten plagues done against Egypt. And so they speak of him as Jehovah, as the Lord in chapter 14. They know his name, his covenant name. Practical observation number four. The Egyptians knew that they were facing and fighting the true God, but continued to do it until the very last minute. There are people all around us just like that. They know God's there, but they're going to fight him to the very last minute. They had seen the witness of God's chosen people for years, just like America has heard the gospel for years, and they still rejected it. Remember, even in America, as then in Egypt, stubborn rebellion always fights against God until it is too late. Then we answered some questions and issues that needed to be resolved. First, how many chariots were there? The obvious answer is there was a minimum of 600, because it says that Pharaoh's chosen chariots there were 600 of them but in context that appears to be a statement of the elite personal chariot guard for pharaoh egypt at that time was the world's superpower and there were millions of people involved in this incident do you think that if you have a minimum of two million jews and i think it was closer to six million if you had six million jews the 600 chariots could beat them Suppose they just turned around and just let the chariots run over them. I mean, that's going to slow them down a little bit. And then the guys on the side will grab the Egyptian, pull them out, and whack them. I think you've got a lot more than just the minimum of 600 chariots. Because it says in verse 7, And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. This is world superpower we're dealing with here. So the actual number of chariots might have been greater, perhaps five to ten times that number, maybe 3,000 to 6,000. When you think miracles and judgments of God, think on a shock and awe scale. This is a wipeout of the world's number one superpower of the time. Shock and awe. <coughs> Second, how many wheels does that make that God knocked off simultaneously? Well, of course, we usually think in terms of two-wheel chariots. But Egypt also had, as we said before, four-wheeled chariots capable of carrying multiple soldiers to the front lines of the battle. If all the chariots were two-wheeled, and if only 600 chariots of the personal guard entered the sea, that's a minimum of 1,200 wheels that had simultaneous flat tires. If there were 3,000 to 6,000 two-wheeled chariots, that's 6,000 to 12,000 wheels that all fell off at once. If all the chariots were four-wheeled chariots, that gives a whopping maximum number of 24,000 wheels that fell off simultaneously. Okay, let's go back to minimums again. If you have two to four horses pulling even 600 chariots, you have 1,200 horses. Those are huge animals in total panic. Imagine the maximum number of, if every chariot had four horses, that's nearly 100,000 maniac horses gone insane. Think anybody got trampled? When you think miracles and judgments of God, think big without the minimum number. It's obvious to see why there was an instant chaos among the charioteers and recognize the sovereign hand of God. The probability of 1,200 minimum, 24,000 maximum, wheels falling off simultaneously is infinitesimally small. There is no probability that that could happen by chance or by accident. Even a pea brain drug addict on angel dust could reach that conclusion that this was a miracle and not just chance. As we said before, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, some of you like drag racing. At that moment, we have the very first recorded drag race in history. 
God took off their chariot wheels that drave them heavily. They dragged them, in other words. So if the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth against them, against the Egyptians, they dragged the chariots. There was your drag race. <clears throat> Never tried to car throw a car with no wheels. How fast can it go? Imagine the thousands of horses dragging chariots with no wheels. Imagine the chaos of at least hundreds and possibly thousands of chariots and horses trying to make a U-turn simultaneously in the pitch dark that you can feel. I mean, we're talking terror. We're talking chaos. Even among highly trained, highly skilled military personnel, crack soldiers, abject terror is what's going on. And that's the song of joy and rejoicing that we see in chapter 15. How God did it. The armies of earth have absolutely no hope against the God of heaven. There's coming another battle like this in Revelation chapter 19. Where the Lord Jesus Christ returns to earth and all those who have trusted in him behind him and the Antichrist and all of his host of earth who've been fighting among themselves realize they've got a bigger enemy and they all turn. Battle of Armageddon is going on. They turn and they fight against the Lord of Heaven. Do you think they're going to win? He will squash them like a worm. People, we're talking shock and awe. We're talking about the nations of the earth standing in awe of the God of heaven. We're talking about God moving in human history because he will be glorified. <clears throat> I hope you get that. That is the God whom you serve. That is the God whom you worship. Don't ever treat him lightly. Too often we're flippant about the God whom we worship. He is the Lord and greatly to be feared and greatly to be praised. There is no searching of his judgments. And we see here his judgment and the rejoicing of God's people when he delivers them from the most terrible superpower of the earth on that time. Powerful pictures that we're giving here. How long did it take to cross the Red Sea? That's where we ended with. There is, is there enough time? You know, a lot of people criticize and say, well, there's no, uh, you know, how could they get across the sea in whatever time you have allotted there? Well, certainly if you're only crossing up the Gulf of Suez, you don't have any problem with the time. But where the text tells us they crossed, they crossed over into Arabia. Paul says so in Galatians. Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. And there's no question in the text. There are no textual errors in the text where Paul writes that. There are no divergent manuscripts that say Sinai Peninsula. They crossed into Arabia. It's not a mistranslation because in the Greek text, it spells it out in Greek letters, Arabia. They crossed into Arabia. <coughs> Not some other place. Sinai was never part of Arabia. That's because God is showing a miracle. Not a well, I guess we could figure it out this way mechanically. He is giving shock and awe to the nations of the earth to know that this is his people and he is their God. How stupid. After the death of Joshua and the elders that outlived Joshua, they turned away to Baalim, to Baals, to false gods. And we'd be in the period of the judges. Well, back to what we're talking about here. It was 118 miles at that point. We talked about the minimum amount of times established in the text. It might have been longer, but we have a minimum amount of 24 hours because it starts in the morning and it ends in the morning. Uh, as they cross the sea, that means that they are going for at least 24 hours across. That averages out. And remember, the Jews were in a panic at this point. They've got the Shekinah glory between them and the Egyptians. But they're crossing the sea. They can 